Bias affects virtually every aspect of the statistics and data science realms. Keep watching and we're going to break down all the different types of statistical bias that you need to be aware of. I'm Richard, this is Richard on Data. They say sometimes in data science and statistics that your goal is to reduce variance. However, bias is another type of error that occurs, and oftentimes it can be just as serious. In fact, the trade-off between bias and variance is one of the most important concepts in the machine learning universe, but that's largely a subject for a different video. So there are seven different types of bias that we're gonna discuss here, and those are selection bias, recall bias, observer bias, survivorship bias, omitted variable bias, sponsorship bias, and cause and effect bias. Before we get into all these, I would humbly ask that if you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel, and also take one second to smash the like button, because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. And I'm also on Patreon if you would like to support my work that way as well. So first and foremost, with selection bias, this is probably the type that the most people are at least somewhat familiar with, and this is the circumstance in which not all people in the study have the same probability of being selected. And there are a number of reasons why this can occur. One particularly common reason is because of sampling bias. So for instance, if you're doing any kind of non-random sampling, like convenience sampling, by definition, not everybody has the same chance of being selected. One type of selection bias is confirmation bias. This is probably everybody's favorite. That's when you tend to utilize and favor certain information that confirms your own pre-existing notions. And my personal favorite example of this is Twitter. So if you go on there expecting that what you see is going to represent public opinion on virtually any topic, most of the time, think again because you have a sample on there that's disproportionately very young and disproportionately of the type of personality that likes to go on Twitter and tweet things. Next up, we have recall bias, which is the phenomenon where subjects will remember things that happened more recently pretty well, but their memory fades the further back you go in the past. Now this is an interesting one because scientists do think that human memory functions sort of like a telephone game. That is, when you remember something that happens in the past, technically, you are remembering the last time that you remembered it. So over time, the accuracy of your memory becomes less and less and less. It's also said that people tend to look at the past through rose-colored glasses. That awesome wedding that you went to a couple years ago? Yeah, at the time, you thought it was awful, and you couldn't wait to go back to your hotel room and sleep. Admit it. Next up, we have observer bias. And this gets to the fact that a lot of data that we collect, or just things we observe in nature in general, are filtered through the lens of human subjectivity. A lot of data had to be collected and measured by somebody, and in fact, sometimes that measurement is subjective, and it could vary from person to person. This is especially the case when researchers are working together on something, because they can influence each other's opinions and findings in ways that would not happen if they were working independently. This is partly the foundation for doing blinded studies, that is, the participant doesn't know what kind of treatment they've received. The reason for that is, some people, they may get a placebo drug, and they start to get better because their brain is telling them they're going to get better because they're on the drug, when really all they're experiencing is the placebo effect. Well, the placebo effect is an example of observer bias. And there's also a related phenomenon known as the Hawthorne effect. This is a really well-known effect where people behave much differently when they know they're being observed. Like that time your boss was behind your shoulder watching you work, then they went away, and then you immediately spent 10 minutes looking at your Instagram feed. You know who you are. Next up is survivorship bias. And this is a lesser known one that's technically a form of selection bias, but this is a special case where the things you observe can only be observed after coming through some long selection process. That survivorship will affect who's in your sample, and often those who make it through the process and those who don't are systematically different in some sort of way, hence you've got a bias. My favorite example of this is from World War II, and it's when the statistician Abraham Wald was involved in figuring out how do we reduce the number of bombers we have that are shot down by enemy fire. 
So they observed planes when they came back from missions, and it was found there were certain parts of the plane that were full of holes, and certain parts of the plane with no holes whatsoever. So Wald proposed, let's put armor on the parts of the plane with no holes that we're seeing. Well, it turns out that if planes were shot in that area that nobody was seeing any holes in, the plane wasn't coming back at all. It would have been shot down. Whereas this area of the plane that was being shot at, adding armor wouldn't help because all the planes that were shot there eventually made it back. So this is a very famous and clever realization of survivorship bias. Next up is omitted variable bias. And this one is related to the very famous curse of dimensionality. That is, if you fit your model with too many variables, it tends not to generalize very well outside of the data it was trained on. That is, it overfits and it has high variance. Well, the opposite of that is true too. If you're omitting certain important variables, the model underfits and it has a bias. Essentially what ends up happening is, effects that should be attributed to the important variables become attributed to the variables which aren't truthfully as important. And whether you have bias or variance in your model, you're going to end up making incorrect or incomplete inferences, and your model is not going to perform as well on a test set if your goal happens to be prediction. Next we have sponsorship bias, and one of the overall most important questions that comes with interpreting any statistical study, and that is, who's paying for it? This is something that I think far too often gets completely forgotten, and that's that scientists are not dispassionate and careless observers of the truth. There will always be a bias in favor of the financial sponsors of a study, and there's also a publication bias. That is, extreme results are far more likely to get published than, well, we looked at this vitamin to figure out if it cures cancer. Turns out, it doesn't. We talked about blinded studies as a way of reducing observer bias, but also we can have double-blinded studies where neither the participants nor the researchers know the real treatment regimen that's going on. That way we can reduce both observer bias as well as sponsorship bias or any other biases that the researchers may suffer from themselves. And then one last bias that's rarely mentioned is what's known as cause-effect bias. Now I'm going to do a whole video series at some point about causal inference because it's truly a very rich topic, but the long and the short of it is, humans like to assume a cause exists even if we haven't demonstrated that it does. As the old adage goes, correlation does not imply causation. When we observe a relationship between two variables x and y, it could be that x causes y, it could also be the case y causes x. Oftentimes, what's really happening is some variable z is causing both x and y. Alternatively, the relationship could be more cyclical. That is, x causes y, then y causes x, in turn causing more of y, and so on and so forth. Or the relationship between x and y could be purely due to chance and coincidence. Either way, you cannot jump to assuming that x causes y. So this is just an overview of the most common types of statistical bias, but one thing to keep in mind is that there are times when it makes sense to accept a little bit of bias with the goal of reducing variance, thus reducing all overall error. But again, that's a subject for a different video. It is worth asking yourself during all stages of statistical analysis and data science, does bias exist anywhere here? And then if it does, how does it influence my results, and can anything be done about it? So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you would like to support my work, one of the most helpful things that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, at least consider hitting the like button, and also leave me a comment down below and let me know what kinds of biases that you've encountered during your data science journey. Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.